I'm Helen Christians, and I will be your MC this morning. I'd like to welcome you to the Sunday morning meeting of the Humanists of Greater Portland. As humanists, we believe in a progressive philosophy that without supernaturalism advocates living an ethical life based on science, reason, and free inquiry. HGP is an all-volunteer group that believes strongly in freedom of speech, but I must state that the views expressed by myself, uh, today's reader, our speaker, HGP members, and our guests at today's meeting are not the official views of the Humanists of Greater Portland. Uh, our founder, Del Allen, uh, I'd like to welcome him now, who has graciously volunteered to do our reading this morning and he's put together a PowerPoint to accompany his reading. Come on in, Dell, and I'm gonna share my screen. This is, my, this is my mother's high school graduation picture. Viola Joles was born in Maple Rapids, Michigan in 1912 to John and Maude Joles. She grew up in the Maple Rapids area and graduated from Maple Rapids High School in 1929. There were four other students in her graduating class. She married Henry Allen in 1937. She had a son in 1939 named Dell. When Dell was born, his legs were not developed correctly, which would have made it difficult to walk. The nurse in attendance urged Viola to rub her son's legs with olive oil, which might help his legs develop in a, norm, a near normal way. Viola was very faithful in her efforts and her son's legs did straighten out to allow him to function normally. Henry took over the family farm a few miles away. Viola helped on the farm and kept house. Number two. Henry raised some sheep on his farm and Dell was occasionally able to take advantage of them. Some were gentle enough to ride on occasion. Number three. <laughs> Viola was a good cook and her son helped out in the kitchen at a young age. Dell and his mother became good friends at an early age. Living on a dairy farm provided plenty of cream for some of their favorite foods, sour cream cookies. Uh, they worked together making lots of sour cream cookies. Dell was a big help as he was able to roll out the cookie dough every, very nicely. His mom cut the flattened dough into three inch square, uh, uh, square pieces, put a raisin in the center and placed them on a cookie sheet. They were fortunate to have electricity so were able to make use of an electric stove. There were always short sour cream cookies available in the Allen household. Four. Dell also helped with the week's washing. Viola was fortunate in that they had purchased a ringer washing machine along with double rinse tubs shortly after their marriage. Hot water was placed in the washing machine tub where the agitator was located. Soap was added to help the agitator get the dirt out of the water and let the dirty water stay in the agitator tub. The ringer turned 360 degrees so it would be turned to any position letting clothes be wrung out at any location. When the clothes were deemed in clean, to be clean, <clears throat> the ringer was set to allow clothes to be sent from the ring, ringer through the ringer, but allowed the dirty water to go back into the washer tub. The clean clothes dropped into clean water in the rinse tub. As the next load of dirty clothes was washing, the ringer was turned to be, to a, be positioned between the two rinse tubs. The water from the first rinse tub drained back into the first tub and the clothes fell into a clean water in the second wrench tub. So Dell's job help was to put clothes carefully into the turning the ring, into the turning ringer. Fortunately, no ninger, no fingers got caught by the turning ringer. Number five. In the year, in the next several years, Mom had a daughter. She often visited my grandparents in town. Number six. Then in May of 1950, we left the farm and moved into my grandfather's house in a nearby community. Family photo uh, just before I left for her home. I left home to teach in Germany. This is the last family photo taken. During my stay in Germany, my parents divorced and there was never another family photo taken. Both parents are now deceased. My two sisters, brother-in-law and mother in my older sister's home in Michigan. Nine. My mother, her aunt, my two children and myself by my mother's house in Michigan in about 1981. Mom passed away on 12 January 2001. 
and was buried in Ovid, Michigan, then later moved to Maple Rapids to be buried next to her mother. Thank you, Dell. Thank you for that Mother's Day tribute. You wrote a pretty good sheep there, buddy. <laughs> Thank you. And your mother was a lovely woman. She's got a great son who started our organization. So thank you so much. Right. Today's speaker will be taking questions at the end of her presentation. Uh, it is my sincere pleasure to introduce Dana Lynn L Lewis. Um, she approaches art making as activism. Today, she'll be taking us through her journey of the past five years from her studio work to collaborations in West Africa, which, le which led to the development of a citywide creative and socially engaging project entitled Gather, Make, Shelter. This project involved over 2,000 people, both housed and unhoused, in Portland, Oregon. Ms. Lewis earned a Master's of Fine Arts from Ohio State University. She has received a multitude of awards for her work from the Pollock Krasner Foundation, the Regional Arts and Culture Council, the Ford Family Foundation, the Oregon Arts Commission, and most recently, Ms. Lewis received a Precipice, Precipice Fund grant from the Andy Warhol Foundation for Visual Arts. Uh, Ms. Lewis's uh, Artist in Residence Awards include Thread, a project of Joseph, Joseph and Annie Elber's Foundation in uh, Senegal, West Africa, uh, the Museum of Art in Tacoma, uh, Gla the Museum of Glass in Tacoma, Washington, Bullseye Glass Factory, just to uh, name a few of her ma many uh, residence, uh, artists in residence projects. We are in for a, a, a really uh, wonderful program today, and I want to uh, just thank her for willing her willingness to share her uh, project and her wonderful art today. Welcome. Okay. First of all, I just want to thank all of you for inviting me and it's a great opportunity for me to learn more about your organization and what you do. And Del, thank you for telling us about your mother and your family. That was really touching and lovely and a nice way to start Mother's Day. Um, I also want to thank Joan Hamilton, who I'm not sure is here or not, but she's um, your friend that brought me to um, speak with you today. So that's, it's really great. Um, so uh, my name is Dana Lynn Lewis. So um, I'm going to actually take you um, since 2016 on a little journey as to how I got to where I am. And um, I'm going to run through a whole bunch of images and I might talk a little bit quick, but I'll definitely hang out for questions after. And, um, and I think people are always curious, it's like, how did you get here? And, and why are you staying here? <laughs> so um, I've been an artist in Portland for 30 years. I came here to be resident at the Oregon College of Art and Craft in 89, I guess. Maybe that's more than 30 years at this point. And, um, and then I got that kind of green blood transfusion, which um, pulled me back to stay. I was told by my professors and everybody else in the world that the only way to make a living was to be a tenure track teaching had get a tenure track teaching position. So I went and I taught at Ohio State for a semester, but then I decided I'm going back to the Northwest and I'm gonna figure this out here. So fast forward to 2016, I was um, one of six artists that were in this um, very special exhibition at the Portland Art Museum called the Northwest Contemporary Art Awards. This is a projector and this was projected in between the old building and the new building. And it was a series of drawings that I don't have the, um, the video attached to this right now that um, I brought people into my process, which is something very much um, inherent in everything I do is that I, I like to invite people to participate. So that gives you a little bit of a clue there. So this was, I did three different, um, three different diff, um, pieces there. Um, and this was one of them. And this is a giant glass tent that, um, you ha is mirrored, all those shapes are mirrored. And this is a very, like, I'd, I spend a bunch of time in Mali, West Africa on a project which we don't have time to talk about today, but that's what led me to Africa in the first place. I'm on the board for an organization called Co Fallen, and we help, I helped start a cultural center there, which is still very much alive and doing great things. Um, Mali was at war, and I was very sad and frustrated for our world and the shape of things. Um, globally. And I created this piece, which was all about my own 
way of putting prayer into it. And prayer isn't about a certain denomination for me, but the thing, uh, something that kind of brings things together around so many different cultures use beads as a, as a method to meditate, to pray, to come together. And beads are kind of also a thing that is about our cellular matter, kind of ties our DNA together. I see that as connective tissue. What is okay, the next slide. So this is a room um, also in the Portland Art Museum that has, uh, I think over 600 mirrors in it and a big glass knot. And it's all about, you can see that the, the way that it kind of connects to each other. There's drawings on the wall, there's drawings on mirrors. You become um, a part of the piece in the fact that you're in the reflections and it's all about sort of like this tying and untying of ourselves, our hopes and dreams and our connecting, our connecting with each other. So the same year I went off to a residency at the Joseph and Annie Albers Foundation in Senegal and it was a really magical time. This is the firing that we did at that residency. Um, it's a project that was, um, that was initiated by the foundation and this is an incredible building by the um, architect Toshiko Mori who's a Harvard professor and she brought her Japanese heritage together with the Joseph and Annie Albers um, vernacular. They were part of the Bauhaus and came here. Joseph Elbers, for those of you who don't know, was the foremost color theorist from um, the Bauhaus movement that came to Black Mountain College back east. And his wife, Annie Elbers, who equally um, accomplished and amazing, but like many women in her position, didn't get, um, didn't get her claim to fame until much later. And she's an extraordinary weaver and maker of many objects. And there've been many, many exhibitions of her work um, after, long after her death, but she's very highly celebrated now. And also somebody who really has influenced my personal work. I came to the village with an open heart and a whole bunch of ideas. I, I teach yoga to disadvantaged and, or to people who don't necessarily get yoga. Like I taught at Hooper Detox. I learned, I worked through living yoga, went through a trauma informed yoga training to do that. And uh, I, I had it in my mind, I could teach yoga. I also had it in my mind that I could work with a group of uh, ceramic artists to potentially teach them surface design. And if they were interested in that, it would, could potentially turn into a new income stream for them. So, oops, how do I go back? Oh, there, that's how I go back. So I got all these things in place and I was having this really great time with everybody. And I got there and then our election happened here. And I, um, the night before the election, I was hanging out with a bunch of the um, artisan residents, none of all of which were African. I was the only American there. And everyone's saying, well, what are you gonna do tomorrow if Trump gets elected? And I was like, that isn't happening. That's just not gonna happen. And they said, no, seriously, what are you gonna do? And I said, it's just not gonna happen. So the next morning, the director came to me and the director had just recently had a child and uh, he had the look on his face. And I've spent, like I said, a bunch of time embedded in villages in West Africa. And to know that more infant mortality is huge. So he had a look on his face that, looked, that made me think as he was approaching that he was gonna tell me that, Musa, that his um, child had died. And I just thought, whoa, he looks so strange. I said, Musa, what's wrong, what's wrong? And as he got closer and closer, he just said the word Trump. And I said, no, 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 no. And he said, yes. And I said, no, there's hanging chads. There's all kinds of like recall stuff. There's county, you know, that's just not possible. And he said, no, it really is possible. And it happened and, and something good will come of this. And I just lost it. And I had all this white gauze with me and I immediately just grabbed all this gauze and I dyed it black and I wrapped myself in it and I sat in my room for a long time. And one of the visiting artists from Mauritania, Omar Ball, who's a really incredible person, um, came into my room at the time that he normally would to say, let's have coffee together. And he bounces into my room and he sees me sitting on my bed like this. And he said, well, what happened? And I said, Trump, and he goes, no. And then he came and he sat next to me and he put his hand on my shoulder. And for literally like five, 10 minutes, we sat there in silence. And then as you see, I was teaching yoga in the village and he had come to call me. Um, Madam Namaste as his pet name for me. And afterward, he said to me, I'm changing your name to Canadian Madam Namaste, and you need to get on with your work here. So this is my studio in Senegal. And 
I, it's it's an incredible place. Several of these pieces, those of you who are in Portland, I think it's mostly people in Portland. Um, I was in an exhibition at the Russo Lee Gallery, which I'll show you some images of too coming up. This is back in, and this is still in Senegal. Sorry, I'm bouncing a little bit here. But another piece that I did was I worked with the villa. I, I, I jumped out of myself. I realized I needed to just stay focused and give my most to this place and to myself and this opportunity that I had to spend seven weeks in the beauty of and and wave of these beautiful people and and their generosity and and love so i stayed and i came back you know in my head and i focused um so i decided the women are like so amazing they do so many things they farm they they make art they are they have new um they're making soap they're selling things in the market they're cooking for their family they're, they're birthing tons of babies i mean they're just totally amazing and I decided I wanted to make a piece that was about them. So I made a giant dress because they're so decked out all the time and they're so beautiful in their, in their work. And I thought that would be the most, the most um, honorable thing I could do was to make a big dress. So I hired tailors to help me work on this. And I got all these rice sacks that I traded old rice sacks for new rice sacks. And we made this big giant dress. It's four meters tall. It also has, I think I put that in here. Yeah, I think you'll see this. It has a video embedded in it of women working. So there's a screen. So this is a, um, a video of women working that was all actually, um, I thought it's a little, it looks like it's going a little slow. It's loading a little slow. But it's all these images of women working that were actually initiated by them. So I had this idea that I would bring these dresses to the world and I would show people about these women and their strength and tenacity of the way that they the way that they are and how amazing they are. And, um, but I also wouldn't do this without their participation. So I showed them the big dress and I created, and I left a big white patch on the back of it. And then I said, hey, would you like to do this? And, and they said, um, they didn't really understand exactly what I was saying, but they loved the dress and they clapped their hands and they said, why are you doing this? And I said, because I wanna bring back to the US and to other countries to show the strength and tenacity and beauty with which you operate and that and and I'd like you to decide what you'd like to show them. And so they all clapped their hands and then they they walked away. They had a big meeting that night. So they were all off to their meeting. And I was like, oh, okay, so that that's not gonna go anywhere. But the next morning I got a knock on my door and one of the kids is like, mama wants you to come film us in the field. Mama wants you to come do this. Mama wants you to come do that. So there was all these different things and they initiated all the filming that happened. What happened after that was um, the women who were the ceramic artists, they, um, I had come to them to talk to them in the beginning about um, the opportunity to do things um, with surface design because they make these gorgeous shapes but they don't have any, um, any um, drawing or, or painting on them. And so they all said, you know, they were skeptical about it. And another artist had taken a lot of their time, a ceramic artist, to do something that was making pots that weren't functional. And I actually saw this before I went, I saw their video online and I thought, I'm gonna present something, they're not gonna like it. And I'm gonna to have to convince them that this is something that would really benefit them and be for them. So without taking too much more time about that topic, um, they were very hesitant, they were very um, um, suspicious, but they also were like really wanting to collaborate with people. This is this is part of what's happening in that village is people are coming from all over the world to, to offer opportunities and not all of them are things that they need or want. So ultimately the ceramic women, um, I said, we I went to talk with them with Musa and I didn't speak any Pular at that point. And the woman was looking at me smiling, yes, 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 yes. And then talking to Musa, and I knew that she was saying, I, we don't want to do this again. We don't want to take our time away from the fields and our children and making because it's, it doesn't benefit us. I just knew, I knew what was going on. So Musa didn't, we walked away from there. Musa said, well, you know, I'm not sure this is going to work. And I said, before you go on, let me just tell you what happened. And he said, you don't speak Pular. And I said, but uh she didn't want me to take the same time as the belgium artists took away from their work and then come up with something that really wasn't going to be benefiting them and she thinks i'm lovely but she doesn't and doesn't want to be rude but she doesn't want to do it and musa said wow you that's exactly and i said well i speak kind of like women and work and i understand that's what happened so after that i said to musa let's wait a week 
So in the meantime, I'm holding babies, I'm teaching yoga, I'm, I'm pulling water, I'm out in the fields with them, they're teasing me for my shitty pular, we're having this great time together. We come back and I said, one week later, we come back and Tulai, who's the head pottery woman said, she brought three of her friends, she brought three of her friends because she wanted to say, we don't want to do this instead of, um, instead of say to me, um, I'm, I'm in charge of, you know, putting the kibosh on this program. Well, we got there and I said, you know, all I want is two sessions, one week of your time. And, um, and they said, what? Like that was really different than, oh no, one day of your time, two sessions, one day of your time. And that's one and a half hours a day. So like two sessions that were a total of three hours. And they said, what? Like, that's really unusual. So then they all, and then they really liked me too, because I had been hanging out with them, holding babies, pulling water, we we're in the fields. And they said, okay, when does Dana leave? And Musa said in four weeks. And they said, okay, we'll do this in three weeks. So they gave me barely any time, but it turned into this extraordinary opportunity that also turned into another residency. So this is me working with them. They never held brushes and pens before, let alone um, drew. And we all the drawing was derived from their fabrics that they were wearing. And it turned into this incredible thing that became a new income stream for them. And we built beautiful friendships. And I, it's hard for me to look at these because I miss them so much. So when I came back um, from that residency, um, I, had a re I had an exhibition right away in Sun Valley at the Friesen Gallery. And this is a piece that I did that's an homage to Sintian. Sintian is the village of the women. And this is about, it's hard to tell from the slide, but this is about um, six feet tall and um, three and a half feet wide. And it's very detailed and layered. And I started working in fibers because of it was easy to take with me. This is also the darkness that I that I did all the fabric when I realized Trump was in office and me imbuing life and beauty back into it. So 2017, I came back, as you know, um, it was difficult here. It was lots of people were, were um, arguing with each other, no matter who people voted for, there was anger all over the place. Lots of people were on the street, um, just very, very difficult time and, and feeling very hopeless. And I came back and I thought, I'm just going back to that beautiful place. I'm not gonna hang out here for four years. I can't take this. And then I thought, okay, whoa pony. Like I know that I can do something. It's great to go to other countries and make a difference but I know I can do something here. And the houseless crisis at, um, has been in my heart for a long time um, on a very personal level um, since I was a kid. But um, meeting people who are houseless and, and volunteering for some agencies and being around the houseless community through my biking and walking and living in Portland and watching it grow over the years um, has just been it building in me and figuring out what, what's the most, what, what can we do? What, how can I contribute something? And so for the long time, it was volunteering at different organizations and that's what I did. So one day I was biking down the Esplanade to my studio in Northwest, which I do a lot. And I passed this houseless camp and uh, I blew a tire. And I had observed many times going by here that um, the, there was a bike mechanic there. And so I pulled into the camp and I said, hey, um, uh, hi, good morning. And the, I was greeted with stick em up hands. And I was like, oh my God, that's so sad. And I just put my hands up and I said, uh, excuse me, I just blew a tire and I'm wondering if I could talk to the bike mechanic because maybe I could hire him to fix my bike. And and they said, who's the bike mechanic? And I said, tall black guy with dreadlocks. And they're like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, him. Oh no, he's not here right now. Oh gosh, your bike, what are we gonna do? We don't have any tires. And they just went into this, like, how can they help me kind of thing. And we exchanged names and had this nice talk and my studio wasn't far away. And there's definitely enough money in my pocket to go buy a new tire. And I just rolled out of there and I was, full of love in my heart because from the connection. And I thought, wow, like these are the kind of connections that I have all the time with people. And if more people were able to find these connections, then maybe that could be the way that I contribute to this situation that we have. So I created Gather Make Shelter with the base, with the baseline of I want people to be able to meet each other at their base level of humanity, no matter where they come from, to create and collaborate and do extraordinary things. And I had no idea that this was going to be a project that would involve, um, as Helen said, over 2,000 people at this point. Um, and I didn't really know 
it would be continuing and now we're in our fourth year. So the first thing I did was go to all these, to spend all this time going to all these social service agencies. And I know that when um, people come to nonprofits and they say, I have a great idea and I wanna contribute something. Sometimes it takes more effort for the agency to absorb their great idea and, and, and try to help them figure out how to address whatever population or issue they're working with. And I, it took me three months to, on my bike, constantly talking and walking and, and uh, all kinds of beverages from morning to night with people. I would definitely always say, people would say, I'll call you and I say, I just need five minutes of your time. I'll show up and I'll leave. They were all personal interactions. And um, I met hundreds of people housed and unhoused. And I didn't want to compete with other organizations in town. And I wanted to figure out something I could do to contribute. So what I want, what I decided to do and what I did was, and then, so somebody at Central City Concern cracked the door. Kathy Pape, this program officer who's actually now joining our board, which is really amazing. She was program officer for Central City Concern for 30 years. So she's an incredible person. And she said, I think you can do this. And that first year, um, lots of people just were shaking their head going, that seems too big. That seems too idealistic. That seems too much. And so I asked all these, after I got people interested, Central City Concern, I had four locations and then all these people started jumping on board. And so ultimately I worked with 17 different social service agencies that first year and villages um, and over 600 people that first year. And so that was 600 people experiencing houselessness and poverty, but then about another 400 people that were ceramic artists and philanthropists and volunteers and people. So what I did was ask ceramic artists all over town to make these beautiful pots. And then I took them into all these different social service agencies and I brought art history materials. It wasn't just like paint your own ceramics. There was painting and drawing and art history and entrepreneurial skill building relative to ceramics. And so this is at Central City Concern at um, the Estate Hotel and a Recovery Program. And it's an example of a uh, program from that time. These are examples of some of the pieces that people did and they were extraordinary pieces. Lots of people, um, I'd say 60, 70% of the people said, I'm not an artist and I've never painted before. And they made so many amazing things. So you can just see this just beautiful, beautiful things. And uh, this is Street Roots. This guy, I mean, I can't find him anymore. I know he's around and I'm not sure. Um, I mean, he's, he's, he's got his own path, but wow. He made some of the most extraordinary things. And uh, I showed this to Liz Leach one day, Liz Leach Gallery. And she's like, I think there's a guy sleeping in, in my doorway. He says that he's an artist, but everyone says they're an artist. And I said, what, what's his name? And she told me, and I pulled this up on my phone and I said, this is his work. And she said, holy, anyway, so it was very exciting. Um, so that it became this great thing and everyone wanted to be part of it. So when people participated, they got $20, they got a t-shirt and we had meals. I never meet with people without having some kind of sustenance. And that's a big part of the program. And this is at the Maybell Center and, um, then um, we decided halfway through the project, we decided, um, I was like, wow, where are we, we need to have some kind of potluck in the park and sell these bowls. Because the whole thing was people donated their bowls back to the project and then those bowls were sold. And ultimately we were able to give $10,000 to two different social service agencies to help get people back into housing. And the people who are houses got to participate in something like that was a really extraordinary thing that they don't usually get to do. So this is my studio and the dress back from Africa, which you re recognize in the background. And this was a couple days before we were gonna have our celebration. So midway through the project, I got a call from Pioneer Courthouse Square and they said, hey, we heard about what you're doing. Can you come down to the square and hold a workshop? And I said, you know, this isn't monkeys in the zoo. We don't, we don't do this in public. This is very, we're, this is a, we're, we're artists. We work together. We do these very serious things. Um, and they said, well, are you going to have, what's your end point? And I said, oh, we're going to have a potluck in the park. Well, maybe you want to have a, a, a thing at Pioneer Courthouse Square. Well, I'm an artist and I do lots of things. You can look me up online. It's danalynnlewis.com. Um, and I do lots of large scale public projects. I've, I've done lots of things, um, you know, public projects in Portland. And I know how to do big things, but I didn't want it to look like a little table in the middle of Pioneer Courthouse Square, like a small Saturday market experience. I want, it had to be fantastic. It had to be, it just really speak of the spirit. So then I had to raise more money. 
So then it turned into this giant festival with tents and music and food. And there were over a thousand people and all the age or not all, but several of the agencies that we worked with came um, and had tents because I also very much about cross pollinating and sharing resources. People should know who we're working with. They should support those people as well. Um, this, we had this big banners that um, like 30 feet long that were the whole process to help people see the process. This is Eileen, who's actually a very, very big part of our project now. Um, we also had that group of people sitting in my studio talking became the ambassadors and the, amb the first group of ambassadors. And the, when you came to this Pioneer Courthouse Square, you bought a bowl, then you were in introduced to an ambassador, say it's Eileen, and that Eileen told, tells you the story of Gather Make Shelter and her personal experience and gives you a coupon for Sisters of the Road Cafe, which is a cafe in town that a lot of the houseless people go to. And then you were, a, you, and she instructed you on how to approach people on the street and give this coupon to them and, and, and gently talk to them about, about, give them the coupon to say, how, how and she instructed people as how people like to be approached on the street, which turned into so many extraordinary interactions and conversations. It was really amazing. This is a, a musical group from the Maybell Center that came together to perform for us. We had this giant banner. I don't know if anybody here was there, but it was it was shockingly successful. I mean, and I, I I I'm so proud of everybody that participated in this project. It also really became like it started with I had an idea about a bowl I had an idea to bring people together but very very quickly it it, it became everybody else impacted the project everybody else created ideas people said I want to perform we should have tents we should do this initially when Pioneer Courthouse Square asked me I said I'll let you know and they said what do you mean this is free and I said well I have to talk to my people and see if they're interested in this and they said, what, this is a really big, we can't hold spots forever, giving you like a prime spot. And I said, okay, just give me a week because I have to talk to people and see if they're comfortable. So I approached my friends who are experiencing houselessness and poverty. And they said, you know, we get kicked out of there. Like, why are we, why do we want to do that? I said, well, if we decide to do this as a group, we call the shots, we say, if it's free, we say, if there's food, we decide if there's a fence around it or not. We decide if there's music, we decide what that music is. And and they said, we have that power. And I said, yes, we have that power. And, and because of that, they believe so many more things are possible. So the next thing was, I was like, gonna shut it down, not shut it down, but like, that was a great year, cool. But everybody from the painters to the potters to the, to, to the philanthropists said, what are we gonna do next? And it turned into this academy. So the academy project is something that I directly paired ceramic artists with, um, painters and formed 18 different relationships and they started to make all these extraordinary things that were supposed to be shown at the Russo Lee gallery last summer and that turned into like so that so we started going on that I paired everybody up got them going and then I was invited back to thread so the, one of the things that I did in these workshops were to show images of the women um, in Senegal working to say, these people didn't do this before. They started their own business with it. And I would bring these plastic photo albums in and show like as, as, as a starter for like, you know, extraordinary things are possible and you too could do this. Well, the women who had invited me to come back were like, what are you doing now? Well, first of all, they didn't understand houselessness at all because they don't have it. So that was a big conversation we had later. But second of all, they were like, well, and I told them, I show pictures of you all the time. And they're like, bring pictures of them because we want to see what they're doing. So I went back to, I set everybody up, got them going, went back to Thread, brought them some t-shirts, told them some stories, which is really amazing. And I was working in my studio on projects and I started two more dresses. These are some of the pieces that are, um, you can see there's pieces at the Russo Gallery if you're interested, this, they still have several pieces that you can see from, from this exact time. This is Mariam, this is my studio. I'm working on these other dresses. There's gonna be an exhibition in San Diego um, in 2022 at Grossmont College. They just built a little museum. So I'm, I'm gonna be showing the dresses for the first time together there. And the women, um, I brought them books of pottery from all over the continent of Africa. And usually they make these beautiful, and this is from the Smithsonian, this book that I brought them. 
usually they make these simple water pots, which you saw in the first slides that I showed you. And I just thought, instead of telling them like, I want you to make these things, I just thought, I just want you to see what other people are doing in other parts of Africa right now. And so they're looking at these things and it turned into all these extraordinary shapes and new ideas. And they made unbelievable things. And so this is me with my friends and um, I miss them so much. And the tailor made me this dress and she made herself one too. And we had this big celebration and the chief of the village was the first person to buy a pot and they sold a bunch of pots and I'm, I'm still in touch with them. I talked to them last week and it's, I, I, I wanna go back so bad. And I know I will, it's just not right now with COVID. And so I came back and I had this exhibition last February in at the Russo Lee Gallery, maybe some of you saw it. And um, my pieces, my pieces that I make, that this is all made out of cloth and, and drawings on cloth and suspended in, in space. And um, these pieces are very much connected to that. It's where I go back and I meditate and, and, I, and I take the energy that I'm given from all these connections that are being made and all these beautiful people around the world that unbeknownst to them have collaborated and influenced each other. And these are my abstract representations of those connections and that beauty. This piece in the background is about, I think it's 11 feet tall and four feet wide. And it is an homage to the first 600 people that I worked with that first year. Each one of those is a small square that is a little bit of like these beads that represent them. And then it casts these shadows in the background which represents their individuality. So, um, I'm back in town. I'm cranking. I'm making my work. The Gather Make Shelter Collective is going like gangbuster. I mean, Gather Make Shelter, sorry, not the collective. I'm getting ahead. Academy is going ahead. We're working on our show at Russo Lee Gallery. Um, I'm taking people to the art museum. We're having all these conversations. This is Tanisha. Tanisha and I are going to start teaching classes. This is the last day that the museum was open. This is Tanisha and the last piece that she made before the pandemic or just as the pandemic hit. This piece will be in the exhibition that we're gonna have this June. And then we started having our meetings two by two in my studio, all masked up. Um, and that I started, I, I initially just got really sad. I thought everything I wanna do now is impossible and illegal. And, um, and I really can't be having these workshops even in the studio. So we stopped that for a while. And then I got a call from the city asking me, I got a call actually not from the city. I got a call from people at Street Roots asking me to participate in, in, in visioning a group called C3PO. And C3PO is creating conscious communities with people outside. And well, this is, well, sorry. This is another slide of um, the Academy. Um, let me back up for one second. This is Peter, Peter's our poet laureate. Peter is paired up with Jennifer Davis, who is a um, illustrator and they're making these zines. And that's part of our work right now too. Peter also is, is going to be speaking at the Gather Make Shelter headquarters, doing poetry readings. We have a roll up garage door and he'll be projecting his image, his voice outside. He's incredible. Some of you might know and see Peter, maybe you've supported Peter. He's at the Northwest um, Whole Foods station selling his street roots and poetry quite often. I'll just give you a little synopsis about what Peter said. Basically, Peter said, you know, Gather Make Shelter comes together to give us opportunities, give us all opportunities to create something we never would have thought of before. He said, artists come together with poets, illustrators, musicians, painters, potters, all these people are coming together in extraordinary ways that never would have happened before. And, and these opportunities are, are game changing in big ways. Basically, that's what what's Peter's saying. So um, I started to tell you about C3PO so that um, the city the Street Roots said, come together, let's talk. 17 different grassroots organizations came together on a Zoom and said, what, are, what, what can we do about this? 
Um, our most vulnerable populations are really going to be under attack and we have to figure out how to help people. And then they talk to the city and the city's like, yes, we need to help you do something. And we created a thing called Creating Conscious Communities with People Outside, C3PO. And we set up three villages, two are on Water Avenue. Um, you've probably seen them. This is one before Gather Make Shelter got a hold of it. And shortly thereafter, um, we did this. And um, they, um, the village, the village that we're looking at is the queer camp. It's queer affinity and it's for the LGBTQ plus camp. And right across the street from them is the BIPOC camp. Um, and that then across the river down by PNCA and Broadway is a blended camp. So the blended camp has elders in it. They have people who have disabilities in it. They have some couples in there. It's anybody who identifies as whatever they want. Um, but really working with the most vulnerable people that are on the street. So we have um, set up these three villages and um, and an example, what I was saying before is that, wait, is that the Southeast Industrial Business Association called me and said, those don't look so good. And I said, well, if you wanna help me, give me some money and I'll make them look better. And so that's what we did. And so now also the people who are living in those villages told me I was originally, you know, I knew that I was embedded in this project and then I, I'm going to stick with it, but they didn't necessarily know that because lots of people were delivering services and then taking off. And so, uh, this person came up to me and said, before you leave, I just want you to know that there is so much calm. And he was apologizing for not speaking English very well. And I was apologizing to him for my Spanish being poor. So we came together and, and it wasn't that difficult to understand. And I can do that in other languages pretty easily at this point. And he said, we are so calm. As soon as this water and clouds came to us, it calmed things down. People aren't taking photographs of us. They're not reaching into to our private spaces and we feel very calm. And also I feel dignity because people ask me where I live when I'm out in the world. And before I say, there's a fence with tents down on Water Avenue. And now I say, I live behind the clouds and the water. And so, um, we wanted to do something on the other side of the river as well. And the Northwest Neighborhood Association um, kept, came together and paid for this. Um, this is how the lower left is how it looked before. And then this is what we did to it. Um, but we also, and, and it's been tagged since then, and we're looking at other what, what we're gonna do to it next. But the other thing is I came to this village and I never, I never, I never just say, I'm going to do this for you or with you. I say, I have an idea. I'm not sure what you think about this. Um, and if you're interested, we could pursue it. And, and you could tell me what you think it should look like or how you think it should go. So these people said, we want the clouds in the water facing inside. So I don't have pictures of that, I don't think. No, I don't. But um, because we can't really take pic a lot of pictures inside. But so we, the, but this village has the clouds in the water facing inside, and that was paid for by the Northwest Neighborhood Association, which is really amazing. And we're hanging it up, and they're saying to me, "This is like really good quality stuff. Like people gave you this." And I said, "Well, Northwest Neighbors did." And and they said, "Who is that?" And I said, the "People who live in these buildings around here and businesses." And they said, "I, I thought those people hated us." And I said, no, they actually are interested in your, your well-being and, and they wanna do something to help your lives here. And they were shocked. So it's very interesting to see how perceptions all across the board are changing and hearts are opening up and people are, are coming together in this project. And I, I feel so, I feel every day, I feel like my heart just keeps expanding, expanding. So we also created a gardening pro project in the beginning, I started Gather Make Shelter with ceramics. Ceramics was something that I do have experience with and I know a lot of people with, and it was about a bowl. Since then, every single project that's come out of Gather Make Shelter has come from me being on the ground, listening and kind of mining creative skills and interests of people and figuring out how to create programs from their interest and skill set that are blossoming. So we had a person who was involved in the villages that had nurseries before they became houseless and were really involved in the nursery community and in big ways had, had his own nursery. And he ignited the idea of a gardening program. And now we have gardening program in three of the villages. And um, one of them is gonna start making, I think they're gonna, we'll see how it goes. They're gonna start making starts of 
um, annuals for sale and we're going to have a plant sale pretty soon, I hope. But right now there's all these people involved and this is you can see inside the village. This is before we got our tiny houses, which you're going to get a little hit on pretty soon. So we're we got all this bamboo donated. We're putting it. This is inside the village in um, at the BIPOC camp. This is in the Northwest camp. This this is all these uh, tents. This is before Christmas, before the holiday season in the winter. And we got all, look at this beautiful garden. I'm so, so happy. Started doing these weaving projects where people are weaving inside and outside of the community. And then we put all these weavings together to create something different. Um, we have creative writing projects. We have a yoga project. Um, and then a couple really interesting things happen. Um, I got a call from Killian Pacific, who's a developer in town, and they said, we hear you need space. And I was like, what? And they said, we, we talked to somebody who said that you need space. So we got on the phone and the next thing I know, they gave us 1900 square feet storefront on 14th and Kearney in Northwest down the street from REI. And we started painting the walls. This table came from whole nine yards. They donated that to us. So we, this big garage door rolls up. So it's totally COVID safe. We have these ramps, so it's also accessible. It's crazy. I mean, it is, it is a crazy, crazy thing that happened to us. And these people are so generous. And I just had a meeting with them the other day. They told us in the beginning, it would be nine months, um, nine, between nine months and two years. They came over the other day and they're like, okay, we don't know when we're gonna, cause they're gonna renovate that building at some point, but they're just like, we don't know when. We wanna collaborate with you. What else can we do together? And we're looking towards the future and other things that we can do. But since we've had this, pro this building, it's a total game changer. I mean, this is Joshua. The first show was Joshua's working on his pieces in the village. And now Joshua's, what that, well, that was a, I think, whoops. You could see Joshua's piece on the right is hanging in our gallery. Then, you know, these, all, all these pe people in the villages started saying, we have a place we can have exhibitions, we can do things, this is amazing, like, let's go for it. So the first, the first show was art in the, from the villages, and these are really extraordinary works. The first, first show we had, we sold about $1,800 worth of work, and all the money that we sell for the artists in that partic these particular kinds of shows goes directly to the artists. This is Joshua's work too, they're really extraordinary. This is a, you know, how the space looks um, now. Another thing that happened is um, we started a public art. Um, we, we got invited by Hygiene for All, which is so, do you know under the Morrison Bridge, under the, so I'll tell you, the underneath the Morrison Bridge, if you're driving south um, and you want to head up Belmont, there's that kind of funny little turn and there's two little pockets in there. And they're usually like camps or that have either just recently been swept or are look like not, you know, people are living there or not. It's always like chasing around. Well, Sandra Comstock from Hygiene for All, that her pro that's her project. And you can look that up online too. It's an extraordinary project. She got the city to give her that space to create a hygiene hub. So for people that don't have hygiene um, opportunities, like we have at C3, 3PO, we have, you know, shower opportunities and, and um, people have lots of opportunities and they have toilets and um, medical, you know, attention and stuff. So hi, Sandra created that under the Morrison Bridge and she called me and said, we're I'm doing this and I know all this infrastructure stuff to do and working on it, but I want it to look good. Can you, can Gathering Shelter make it look good? So I brought two people together who I've been working with for the first, um, since since three years ago from the project, Michael and Eileen. And this was our first thing we did before we even had an exhibition at our, our headquarters, is we came together and we worked for several months on creating these fence lines that now wrap the hygiene hub. So Michael does this Native American um, from riff, riffing off of his own heritage drawings that, that are the black and white drawings. And Eileen is a painter and sculptor and does all kinds of things. Um, Michael never thought of himself as an artist before he came to this project and, and that's interesting because his life is changing and as a result of it and Eileen his life is expanding as well. And I'll tell you more about that in a second. But here is the hygiene hub. We decided we would paint all these um, structures in, in colorful, you know, bright colors. 
We got the gardeners in from the other project. We hired them to work on it. We painted the pavement this, what I'm calling the Frida Kahlo blue, because it's the color of Frida Kahlo's house. And I'm inspired by that. And now it's like this gem under the bridge. And it's a place where people come. They are singing in the shower. It's, it's really an extraordinary project. And we're getting more involved with Sandra on that as well. This is what those tiny little drawings turned into, is these beautiful things that now wrap the site for privacy. So uh, Michael and I, we were working together in the shop and these friends of mine that own a Flipside hat company in town saw his drawings and said, whoa, these are amazing. So now they're hiring Michael to work with them on a new line for their fall collection. Eileen and I were, um, we've been working together for a long time too. And I got a call in January saying that I got a precipice award through PICA with the Andy Warhol Foundation. And they asked me if I could tell them um, about an artist that they might not know in town they, to nominate. And I nominated Eileen and she got it as well. So the threat of pe meeting people from the beginning, meeting them in its different agencies and, and support systems around town, coming together to paint bowls, coming together to create the academy, being ambassadors, now making public art projects. And the next project um, we're gonna do is a project called The Collective, which I'm not sure we have time to talk about. But the next show that we did at the space was we got a letterpress artist, Tracy Schlapp from Commerce and Multiples to come together and create Valentine's. In December, the county bought us tiny houses to replace those tents that you saw, and it's a game changer. And so I asked artists all over Portland if they'd be interested in donating tiny paintings for the tiny houses. And so we literally have thousands of dollars worth of work on our wall right now from people that did that. Then the people who are from the villages came in to make Valentine's. So when they go and they get a piece from our show that's up right now, they will exchange a Valentine that they've made with Tracy in this project. And these are some of the beginnings of that, those Valentines and the work that they were doing. These are some of the pieces from the exhibition. This is David Brandt on the left. Okay. Well, let's see if this works or not, but this is actually, I can tell you, um, two of these people are Guggenheim fellows. Um, another person is a, um, has been working at PNCA for many years. And another person came to me through the project whose work I wasn't familiar with before. This is the kind of work that, that is being donated to the Tiny House Project. Where else? This is Aaron. Aaron picked this piece by Malia Jensen. Malia Jensen um, is redoing the, the bills to create Ruth Bader Ginsburg bills. And, and he was very excited to pick that piece. So this is Aaron with Malia's piece. So this just gives you an idea of all this extraordinary work. Christopher Rauschenberg is in the show. Marty Widman, Dan Welty, Don Welty, all, just, just all these, Linda Hutchins, Bethany Rowland, all these incredible people donated these works. And I get to play like fairy and take them back to them next week. I'm so excited. So this is the Gather Make Shelter headquarters. So this is some of the products that we create. These are these amazing, this is Eileen's work that's up right now. If you came in, you could see that display. We got these t-shirt machines donated to us by the Shipley family to make our own, to start our own cottage industry, which is unbelievable. And we have these beautiful pieces that are up and people that were working on their pieces. We also have bowls from the project that are for sale. This garage door comes up and it's very COVID safe. Our gallery hours are Fridays and Saturdays from four, from 12 to four, and you should stop by. Um, what's next is the Gather Make Shelter is creating a collective whereby we will come together and we will, we will apply for public art projects and museum shows. We will also do speaking engagements together. We will go out into other communities and explain how this happened and how you too could get involved um, and how people in their own communities could could envision projects of that, that feel right to their own communities and how they could find connection and, and come together and, and take bold steps. So thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate being able to share this with you. Um, gathermakeshelter.org has a lot more information on it and videos. 
Um, like I said, we have our, our, um, our headquarters is there for as long as we know. And, and our next exhibition is gonna be really amazing with a bunch of artists um, from the villages, again, with new works. Um, in July, we have an exhibition at the Russo Lee Gallery. That, ga that show I was talking about is actually happening. We also are gonna have several things happening in July, the space. Peter's gonna be reading poetry. Artists are gonna be doing talks. We have a fundraiser coming up um, in, Jan in July. I think we only have a hundred tickets for that. So that's gonna be, it's unfortunate that we can't have more people, but there'll also be opportunities to participate in that. If you're interested in getting on our mailing list and learning about that, I can forward that information to you. So I, I went over time. So I wanna leave room if there's any time for questions, I'm not sure, but thank you so much for having me today. I really appreciate it. Oh, I can't thank you enough for sharing your wonderful work with us and uh... We, we do present a, a cup to our speakers just to make sure that you can Aww. remember who we are and it has our, our website on the back. Um, That's great. Thank <laughs> and, you. That's yes, really great. Your friends know that, and, and it'll let people know where, where you, they can find your video of your uh, That's great. Thank you so much. David, sure. David, looks like you've got our first question. Um, yeah, I'll ask one. Um, yeah. So yeah, this this sounds fantastic. I I will ask you about a few friends of mine in the art community later on. Um, but um, so where there is art and the homeless community meeting, are you then now this the central point of focus for that, or are there other uh, people and places doing this kind of work, or or are you kind of the, the, the place to go? I think, so PEAR has been around for a very long time. PEAR is a fantastic organization that works with houseless youth. And I've worked with them as well. And they've been a lot around much longer than I have. Um, people do art projects with people who are experiencing houseless and poverty in different ways. Um, I'm told that we're the only interdisciplinary, intergenerational art project working with the houseless um, around. That's what I'm told. I mean, I, I, um, I also get a lot of people that come to me saying you're doing this and I'm, an, I'm a musician or I'm a this or I'm a that. And how do we, how do we have, how do we, how can we create a project together? And so we've, um, we've you know, tried to figure out some of that too. Um, I've spent a ton of time on the ground and also with agencies, like I said, trying to figure out how to add to their programs, um, how we can collaborate and, um, and so that we can contribute things that we wouldn't have contributed before without it being something that takes away from their projects. So yeah, I think, I think as far as like how much we're doing and how many, the interdisciplinary nature of it and the ways like, um, there's several places that I haven't been able to, because there's only so much of us. Frankly, I'm 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 like triple full time plus, and I have a tiny staff um, of five people that are a few hours a week each that do different things. Um, we're really confident about growing that. We're you know we're starting. Um, we have a fiscal sponsor in the um, charitable partnership fund, and we're getting our own 501c3 now. And, um, and I think in the, I, what I didn't say was, so in the beginning, Gather Make Shelter, I tried really hard to get grants and support and people didn't think it was possible, which is what I was told from granting organizations and also some larger individuals who came forward later. Um, a couple individuals, really amazing people who've known me for a while said, all right, you don't have any money and you have all this gumption, you gotta do this. And they each gave me $5,000 and that was mm -hmm. kickstarted the program. But I raised ninety three thousand dollars by myself that first year without any grants, and that was all lots of coffee and tea and beverages and lunch and breakfast and dinner and bicycle riding and dragging around my plastic photo album and showing it to people, and they start crying and then they give me money. So um, that's you know at being able to tell people the stories um, and and Helen, a lot of people don't know about the project, so it's really great to be able to now you know, you know, and, <laughs> right. and now other people know, and because of your organization, this will go out and you'll be able to share it or you can share it with your friends and whatnot. Yes. Since then, several, you can see online who's contributed. We have a, a big list of our supporters. You know, we've, we've gotten support. 
I'm a finalist for you know a big grant right now that we're waiting to hear from that we have several grants in the queue people are inviting us to apply for grants um, there's you know people are continuing their support people are coming to our fundraisers um, I'm confident that that I'll be able to do more with more people and be able to say yes to more people as a result of you know more support coming in so like Kenton Women's Village would really like us to work with them and um, at this moment, I, 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 there's, I can't stretch that far, but they're on my list and we will work with them. We have a, a question from Joyce Lackey. Do you know Terrence Moses, who travels to homeless communities every day, bringing water and diapers supplies? He may or may not know about you, but this may also be a networking opportunity. I, I don't know Terrence and um, does, does he have a name of his organization or just individual? I think he's just an individual. He's just a guy that is making a difference uh, with a pickup truck. That's so great. Yeah. yeah. Bless, bless, bless those people. You know, there's people also like diapers, all that stuff is so important. And I think, I think, you know, even if it's not like a creative or it does not seen as a creative connection, I feel like there's all this create, like, a, like it's a visual art thing. I think there's all this creativity that's blossoming out of people's hearts right now around, okay, what can I do? You know, like I can, I can go buy and deliver diapers. Awesome. You know, it doesn't have to be like create a big thing or engage hundreds of people you know, that, that makes an impact. Every single thing that people can find in their, their hearts, their skills, their, their resources, whatever it is, it's all part of it. You know, early on, another thing is that I, I, I've been asked, you know, because with grants and things, what are the quantifiable outcomes of your project? Yes. And, and how many people are you getting in personally into housing and all that stuff? And I think, it requires a lot of layers of participation. And I was really heartened by hearing the director of Central City Concern a couple of years ago in their 40th anniversary in the park speak. She's, she's an amazing person. And the first thing she said was she was talking um, you know, about Central City Concern and, and, and their process. And she said, I get asked all the time, does Central City Concern solve the housing crisis? How, how is Central City? She said, we are not solving it. And I thought, oh, she just took a huge load off my little shoulders because I'm asked that all the time with my little art project, which is not a little art project anymore. But, um, and I listened to her and she said, it, and it's what I say too. And what I said before is that it requires all of us. It requires <laughs> lots of different layers of participatory solutions towards getting everybody safe and into housing. I mean, what we want is like right now, this alternative shelter model, which is C3PO, the city's actually expanding the alternative shelter model to support more alternative shelters because of the success of our villages this year. That's amazing. But the alternative shelter model isn't necessarily like the end all. However, we're not at a place where we can house everybody successfully. We can't, we don't have enough affordable housing. So until that happens, we need lots of different solutions, lots of different entry points for people to have the safety that they want and that situation, multiple situations that they want. Um, I have a question that I, uh, how do people get into the, the villages compared to camping, just taking a tent and camping on the street? I, I just, I feel so distant from those yeah. understanding that. So that our villages were set up with um, population specific in the beginning, like I mentioned, the BIPOC yeah. village, the um, LGBTQ plus village, and the blended village. People, um, people who know people like me said, hey, apply for this. And, you know, or people would be at the Q center and say, hey, there's this thing coming up, apply for this. So people would fill out an application. Initially, they fill out an application and first come first serve, they got into the village. Now, the villages are working towards self-governance, and there's a whole lot of things about living in community, right, that, that can, can make us all kind of like have issues. And then you put the pandemic on top of that, and you put like houselessness on top of that, and it's been a complicated mm -hmm. year. But what I remind everybody, like when I'm in village meetings all the time and, and people are like, why is this so hard? And we just can't get along or this isn't happening fast enough. And I'm like, you know, the people that live in the condos up there, like they're fighting too, like in their condo associations or the neighborhood barking dog next door or whatever. People, are, people have to figure out ways to live together and, and, 
and everybody has to come up with some kind of rules and ideas about uh, how that happens. So your question, how do people get in? Now people fill out a form and then they take an interview with the people who live there. Oh. And not everybody, not everybody wants to do what a village wants, what the villages want to, would have come to be. You know, people volunteer. There's possibilities for, for jobs that people get paid for, but there's a lot of volunteer work that has to happen for you to live there. Mm -hmm. And you, community meetings, attendance for that, all kinds of stuff that are um, de-escalation trainings, you know, all kinds of stuff that is part of the village that someone may or may not want to. Like my friend Peter, the, our poet, he doesn't want, I, I could have like easily gotten Peter into a village and that's just not Peter. You know, that's, that's not what's going to make him the happiest. And he, he is not interested in that. So everybody just like housed people, you know, there's different levels of wanting to be communal and, and being successful at that. Dana, I'm an occupational therapist by trade and uh, profession. And uh, what you do is, you know, you should become an honorary occupational therapist because, <laughs> you know, health through doing, uh, health through doing, uh, how, how have you, re you know, realized, and I, we just got a few more minutes, but working with people who uh, um, have some mental health issues, yeah. how, how, have, how have you done your training? I mean, just, I, that's a big question. And uh, yeah. just, could you just give me a, just a little synopsis? Sure. Um, I personally have just a uh, personal experience with family members and, and, um, without going too deep into that. Yeah. Um, and growing up, figuring out how to find generosity towards, towards yes. that. But also um, I, I've been volunteering since I got to Portland in different organizations. And I did a big project at the Oregon State Hospital, which I was embedded in the hospital for a year as an artist in residence. And that was a game changer. And uh, I worked with a lot of people who had experienced houselessness who are in the hospital. And um, that was really beautiful and, and gave me a lot of, a lot of on the job training. And, um, and I also have done the trainings with um, living yoga and that's trauma informed yoga and taught through that program. And my experience in West Africa with people there who honor humanity above anything else and and when I talk about we get we come together to meet at our base level of humanity, it's like nobody passes each other on the on the the road there without saying hello. And if you know somebody a little bit better, how'd you sleep last night? And if you know somebody a little bit better, how are your goats? How's your mom? You know, and and we don't do that here. No, we don't. We don't do that here organically. And we don't we don't do that enough here. I shouldn't say we don't do that totally here. We don't do that enough here. But one of the goals of Gather Make Shelter is to do that more. So a little side story on that is uh, one of my project participants was on a bus and she was wearing her t-shirt. And I tell them about, we meet at our base level of humanity. I tell them about Africa and the goats and how, all that stuff. So she was on a bus and this man came up to her and said, hi, um, are you working on that project? And she said, yeah, I'm a Gather Make Shelter ambassador. Who are you? And he said, well, I went to Pioneer Courthouse Square and uh, were you there? And she said, yeah. And she said, did you buy a bull? And he said, yeah. And he said, well, what's good? Anyway, he came and sat with her for, he said, can I sit with you? And so he sat with her and they wound up taking the bus together. And the first thing she said to him was, so how'd you sleep last night? <laughs> and then he said, okay. And she said, and how are your goats doing? <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so then she wound up telling him all about Africa and my influ our, why we're, our project is influenced by the spirit of these people and the humanity on the ground. And so anyway, that's just a little just, example. Thank you, Dana. Uh, just a real quick comment from Ingrid. Uh, the, your program reminds Ingrid of uh, Christinia uh, in Christiania. Copenhagen. Christiania, sorry. I, pronunciation is not my strength. It is a community that has become a self-governing group that started right after World War II. Because this group has paid huge amounts of taxes to the city of Copenhagen, they have gen generally been left alone to live as they choose. Wow. wow. 
I want to go check that out. I wish it wasn't COVID right now. That yeah. sounds great. I just wrote it down. Thank you for that. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. 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 Also, um, follow us. You can look at us on, you know, our, our website is gathermakeshelter.org. Okay. My personal is uh, danalynlewis.com. And um, I'm not in charge of the social media. I'm not sure how up to date it is, but um, we have a we have accounts in social media you can look up okay. um and also um come see us at the space yes and you're open fridays from uh, fridays from 12 to 4 and saturdays four. from 12 to 4. oh good two days yeah mm -hmm. and there's a variety of volunteers that run that sometimes i'm there um right now on fridays um there's also workshops going on because we're getting ready for that show sure. so we're trying to like double up on what we do there um 14th and Kearney in Northwest down the street from REI. Okay. Oh yeah. I know where that is. Okay. Yeah. It's a big storefront. You can see gather, make shelter really yeah. big outside. Yeah. Yes. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank um, you.